Greetings aspirants, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today I am going to cover 8 different news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 20th of January 2023 and displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today, you can go through it. And a kind request to you all, those who have not yet subscribed our YouTube channel, please subscribe and do hit the bell icon button to get regular notifications regarding our current of videos. Now with this note, let us get into first news article discussion. Now for our first discussion, we are going to take this editorial article. This editorial article talks about the annual status of education report, which is shortly known as ASER. The editorial highlights some positives from the recent report. The editorial also points out some of the issues plaguing the Indian education system, which is highlighted in the report. Finally, it offers some solution for the issues. This is about the editorial. So in our discussion, let us first see some important points about the ASER report and let us also see in detail about the points mentioned in the article. The discussion that we are going to have will come under these sections of the syllabus. Kindly go through it. Now first let's start with ASER report. ASER which stands for the annual status of education report is a citizen led household survey. The report has been released by Pratham which is a non-governmental organization. The report focuses on the children's schooling and learning status. Under this report, the enrollment status of children in the age group of 3 to 16 is surveyed. And the children in the age group 5 to 16 are tested for their ability to read simple text and do basic arithmetic. The survey is conducted at a national, state and district level. Remember, ASCR is a rural survey and urban areas are not covered. Also note that ASER is a household based survey rather than a school based survey. This is because it enables all children to be included in the survey. Like those who have never been to school or have dropped out as well as those who are in government schools, private schools, religious schools or anywhere else. ASER has been conducted every year since 2005 except for the year 2015. The survey is carried out each year with the help of volunteers from partner organizations like colleges, universities, non-profit organizations and teacher training institutes. Know that the 2022 ASCR survey reached almost 7 lakh children in over 19,000 villages across 616 districts in India. See these are some basic facts about the ASCR report. Now let us see some important findings of the 2022 ASCR report. First one is the increase in the enrollment ratio. The overall enrollment ratio in schools across the country has increased at all levels. In the age group of 6 to 14 years, the enrollment ratio in the year 2018 was 97.2 percentage and in the year 2022 it was 98.4%. So basically almost all rural children have been enrolled in school. The increased enrollment has both advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is that increasing enrollment ratio ensures that students stay in school for a longer and sustained period of time. This will provide long term benefits for the students. The increasing enrollment ratio also has some disadvantages associated with it. The first disadvantage is increased competition in the post secondary phase. As more students are enrolled in primary school, in the future more students will attend middle school and then secondary school. Due to this factor, the competition for post-secondary school education will increase. The second disadvantage is the issue of grade inflation due to increased competition. Here grade inflation is an increase in average marks obtained by students of a particular standard over time. For example, every year the NEET cutoff and the JEE exam cutoff are increasing, right? This is called grade inflation. The author feels that grade inflation will increase acute exam stress faced by students. Finally, there is the issue of inability to get appropriate employment. On one hand, the number of students enrolled and completing education is increasing. On the other hand, the job market has stagnated. Due to this mismatch, people completing education will find it difficult to have appropriate employment. So there are some of the advantages and disadvantages associated with increased enrollment ratios. The second important finding of the ASER report is in regards to the enrollment in government schools. Now look at this graph, this graph showing the enrollment rates. In this, the blue portion highlights rural children enrolled in government schools. 
from the graph you can clearly see that there is a noticeable increase in enrollment in government schools between the year 2018 and 2022 this is an important phenomenon but what may be the reason that resulted in an increase in enrollment in government schools the editorial has some answers regarding this trend the first reason is decrease in family income due to covid induced lockdown the second reason is permanent closures of low cost private schools and the last reason is efforts by the state governments to keep the government schools open and provide provisions like midday meals and remotely sharing teaching material all these factors resulted in an increase in enrollment ratio in government schools the third important finding of the asr report is regards to the proportion of students who are taking private tuition now look at this table from this table you can see that in the all india level the proportion of students availing private tuitions has increased in 2022 compared to 2018 in 2018 it was 26.4 percentage and in the year 2022 it was 30.5 percentage except for gujarat tamil nadu karnataka kerala and tripura the phenomena of increase in students opting for private tuition has been witnessed then the fourth important finding is in regards to proportion of girls who are not currently enrolled actually the proportion of girls who are not enrolled has come down in 2018 at the all india level the percentage of girls aged between 11 to 14 who are out of school stood at 4.1 percentage in the year 2022 this percentage has dropped down to just 2 percentage and the last major finding of the asr report is in regards to learning outcomes the learning outcomes were worrisome for the year 2018 and it has further declined for the year 2022 here first let's take reading skills students are given standard 2 level text to assess their skills now look at this graph the graph shows the number of boys and girls in standard 3 5 and 8 who are able to read class 2 level text the light blue bar represents 2018 and the dark blue bar represents 2022 if you notice in all the three standards among both boys and girls the reading skill has declined in 2022 compared to 2018 now moving on to math skills for arithmetic skills students ability to divide a three digit number by a one digit number is evaluated now look at this graph the graph shows the ability of boys and girls in standard 5 and standard 8 to do division here also the outcome has dropped for the year 2022 compared to 2018 but the drop in arithmetic skills is less compared to drop in reading skills and these are some of the major findings of the asr report 2022 from the data from the asr report 2022 that we just saw we can essentially say that many children in india are reaching standard 8 without being sufficiently equipped with foundational literacy and numeracy skills but why is the foundational literacy and numeracy skills among indian students low the editorial gives some insights regarding this The first reason is the over ambitious curriculum compared to other countries indian students have a wider syllabus due to this they are forced into rote learning this affects the learning outcomes of the students then the second reason is no in school catch up mechanism that is in the schools there is no help provided to the students who are performing poorly due to this they are not able to catch up with the rest of their class this affects their motivation to learn and their confidence level The last reason is our school system is driven by preparations for board examinations. There is no avenue for the students to think and have original thought. This also impacts their learning outcome. See, these are all some of the reasons that impact the learning outcome of the students according to the editorial. The government on its part has recognized this as an issue. The National Education Policy 2020 aims to improve the learning outcomes of the students. the policy gives high priority to the acquisition of foundational literacy and numeracy skills especially for children in early grades to implement the policy the government launched the program nipun bharat here nipun stands for national initiative for proficiency in reading with understanding and numeracy this is a good initiative by the government to provide strong foundations for children in the early years the editorial while concluding says that in addition to programs like nipun bharat the government must also take initiatives to address learning loss and help students in the middle school who are lagging behind to catch up with the rest of the students and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about asr report then we saw some important findings of the asr 2022 report then we saw about the reasons that impact the learning outcomes of the students and finally we saw some solutions to improve the learning outcome of the students 
see this editorial article is very very important for your mains exam you may get a mains questions regarding enrollment ratio and learning outcome and all so you can use these points while writing your mains answer this will definitely enrich your mains answer so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have you looked at this news article this article here shares the news about the demise of the most renowned bharatanatyam dancer and guru writer and research scholar lakshmi viswanathan on thursday now in this context let us learn about bharatanatyam from our exam perspective see bharatanatyam is one of the oldest dance form which is considered to be over 2000 years old and it is most popular forms of classical dance that originated in the tanjavur district in tamil nadu also it is one among the eight classical dances of india the origin of this dance can be traced to the sage bharata muni who had mentioned it in his literature called the natya shastra the style was kept alive by the devadasis now who are devadasis see they are the young girls who are gifted by their parents to the temples who are then married to the gods this is a brief about bharatanatyam dance form now we will see some important features of this dance form see bharatanatyam is also called as ekaharya because here one dancer take up many roles in a single performance basically bharatanatyam is a solo dance which includes both the aspects they are nritta that is pure steps as well as abhinaya that is expressions in equal measures this is the first feature the second feature is bharatanatyam is also called the fire dance if we closely watch the movements of bharatanatyam it resembles the movements of dancing flame this is the second feature then the third feature is bharatanatyam is practiced by both the men and women contemporarily the dance was practiced more by women this is the third feature now coming to the fourth feature the meaning of lyrics of the song that the dancer dances to is conveyed to the audience with the help of hand gestures and facial expressions it mostly has a love theme but it is devotional this is the fourth feature and the fifth distinctive feature of bharatanatyam is its basic posture which is called arai mandi or ardha mandali see this image here it is the half sit position wherein the body forms a series of triangles and this posture is called arai mandi this is the fifth feature then the sixth feature is bharatanatyam is based on carnatic music it has a rigid and a well defined tal structure and a raga system the accompanying artists are equally important because it requires a great deal of coordination and understanding between the musicians and the dancer this is the sixth feature and the final feature is the bharatanatyam dance form includes the nine moods it includes the expressions of peace happiness sadness love disgust and so on these facial expressions are very significant in performing the bharatanatyam dance to say simply without these expressions these dance forms appear lifeless and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about bharatanatyam then about the origin of bharatanatyam and finally we saw some important features of bharatanatyam dance form see this topic is very potential for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here this news article says that the third desalination plant on the east coast road at nemili will be completed by july actually this plant is located in tamil nadu and this facility would be able to treat 150 million liters of sea water every day so what is this desalination let us understand that in this news article discussion now before that the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can go through it first of all what is desalination desalination is the process of removing salts from water to produce water that meets the quality that is the salinity requirements of different human users see the most commonly used technology for the desalination process is reverse osmosis i hope you all know about reverse osmosis see reverse osmosis is a water purification process that uses a partially permeable membrane to separate ions unwanted molecules and larger particles from drinking water now look at this image here whenever an external pressure is applied to push solvents from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration through a semi permeable membrane the microscopic pores in the membranes allows only the water molecules pass through it so clean water is released from the other side after salt and the majority of other impurities are left behind 
These plants are mostly set up in areas that have access to sea water. If you ask me how widely this technology is used, see Tamil Nadu was the first state in India to implement this technology. Tamil Nadu has built two desalination facilities close to Chennai in 2010 and 2013 respectively. Each of the two plants provides Chennai with 100 MLD of water per day. Now the third plant will be completed by July and the Tamil Nadu is also planning to set up another one plant. Then the other proposed states include Gujarat which intends to build a 100 MLD RO plant along the Jodia coast in Jamnagar district. Additionally, there are plans to build desalination facilities in Gujarat's coastal communities of Dwaraka, Kutch, Dahage, Somnath, Bhavnagar and Pipavav. Then the state of Andhra Pradesh also intends to build a desalination plant. And this is all about the desalination plant. Now moving on to see the advantages of desalination plants. The first and foremost advantage is it can extend water supplies beyond what is available from the hydrological cycle and it provides an unlimited climate independent and steady supply of high quality water. Secondly, the desalination plants is capable to meet or exceed the standards for water quality. Then thirdly, it can provide drinking water in areas where no natural supply of portable water exists. And finally, water desalination plants can ease pressure on freshwater supplies that come from areas that is the over exploited water resources that need to be protected. And this is all about the advantages of desalination plants. If there are advantages, it also has some disadvantages, right? Now we'll see the disadvantages of desalination plants. The first disadvantage is desalination plants are costly to build and operate and the plants require huge amounts of energy. See, one third to half of the overall cost of producing desalinated water is attributable to energy costs. Since energy is such a large portion of the total cost, the cost is also greatly affected by changes in the price of energy. Then the second disadvantage is environmental impact. See, the disposal of the salt removed from the water is a major issue. See, brine is a high concentration solution of salt in water. When they are released, they have the potential to alter the salinity and decrease the amount of oxygen in the water. This can stress and even kill the animals that are very not used to expose to the higher salinity levels. In addition, the desalination process uses or produces numerous chemicals including chlorine, carbon dioxide and hydrochloric acid that can be harmful in high concentrations. And finally, the harmful chemicals can end up severely damaging the local ecology around the plants as well. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is desalination. Then we saw about the reverse osmosis process. Then we saw about what are the states which are using this technology. And finally, we saw some advantages and disadvantages of desalination plants. So this topic is very much important for your mains exam. And UPSC may put a question in prelims also. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this editorial article here. This article is about the POXO Act. You all know the expansion of the act, right? It is the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act. It came into effect in the year 2012. So it's been 10 years since the enforcement of the act. The author of the article is saying that the act was enacted as a consequence of India's ratification of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1992. So, in this article, the author has discussed about the significance and issues of the POXO Act. Now, we will also see them. But before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here. You can go through it. First of all, let us see briefly about POXO Act 2012. In India, the child sexual abuse was covered under IPC sections 375, 354 and 377. The major drawback in this is that these provisions did not specifically protect the children from sexual abuse and they generally cover about the rape and unnatural sex. Other than this, they did not protect male children from sexual abuse. Also, some of the terms used in these sections such as modesty and unnatural offence are not defined in the Indian Penal Code. So, because of these reasons, POXO Act was enacted. And the sole aim of the act is to address offences of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse of children. Now with this information, let us see the significant features of the act. Firstly, there is this general neutral provision. 
Paxo Act does not create any distinction between the victim and the perpetrators on the basis of their gender. As per the Act, the definition of child includes anyone below 18 years of age. The courts have even convicted women for engaging in child sexual abuse incidents. This is significant because data says that in Chhattisgarh, male child victims accounted for about 8 in every 1000 POXO cases. That is approximately 0.8 percentage. This may not be a big percentage, but there are cases where male children are also affected, right? So the general neutral provision of POXO Act is very significant. Secondly, there is sufficient general awareness among the public to report cases of sexual exploitation of children. This is because of the provision of mandatory reporting of child abuse cases and not reporting has been made a specific offence under the POXO Act. This is one another significant feature of the Act. Thirdly, as per the POXO Act, storage of child pornography material has been made a new offence. Then fourthly, the offence of sexual assault has been defined in explicit terms. This is significant because no clear definition has been given in the Indian Penal Code. There are also some of the significant provisions of the Pox Act mentioned in the editorial by the author. This is about provisions of the Pox Act. Now let us see about the issues. Firstly, the author is saying that there is no change in investigation. See, a large part of the investigation under the Act is still guided by Code of Criminal Procedure. For example, the investigation of penetrative sexual assault cases generally involves recording the statement of the prosecutrix, then a medical and forensic science laboratory examination, and determination of child's age. So the first issue is the investigation is still guided by code of criminal procedure. The second issue as per the author is inadequate number of women officers. The POXO Act provides for recording the statement of the affected child by a woman sub-inspector. But the problem here is that the number of women in the police force is just 10 percentage. Unfortunately, many police stations have no women staff at all and this should be changed. Then the third issue is the lack of infrastructure. There is a provision to record statements using audio video means. This provision will remain a challenge because there is no proper infrastructure to ensure the integrity of electronic evidence. Then the fourth issue is the absence of cross-examination of judicial magistrate. There is a provision in the POXO Act which mandates the recording of the statement of the child by a judicial magistrate. So, during trial in a court, the judicial magistrates are not called for cross-examination. Then what is the necessary for this provision, right? Then the fifth issue is, the medical examination of the prosecutrix is conducted according to the provisions of Code of Criminal Procedure. Here, prosecutrix is a female victim of a crime on whose behalf the state is prosecuting a suspect. Here, the worrying factor is that there are instances where the banned two-finger test is still in use. Then the sixth issue is that there have been no attempts to upgrade forensic science laboratory in states. As per the author, there are many cases where a charge sheet has been filed without a forensic laboratory report. Then seventhly, there is the issue of age determination. See, the age determination of a juvenile delinquent is guided by Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act. But there is no such provision under the POXO Act for juvenile victims. So, this makes it difficult to prove that a particular child is below the age of 18 years. The Supreme Court in Jarnail Singh vs. State of Haryana 2013 case held that in absence of the law to determine the age, the investigating officers can rely on the date of birth recorded in school admission or withdrawal registers. Here also there is an issue. Most often, the parents are not able to produce these documents due to the absence of authentic record. Then eighthly, the issues with regard to the period of investigation. The time period to complete investigation of rape is two months. This was done to give speedy justice to the victim. But the issue here is that the time constraint puts much pressure on the investigating officers as they have to submit a charge sheet in two months irrespective of the investigation stage. There is a fear about internal punishment to investigation officers. POXO cases are supervised by the Ministry of Home Affairs. The supervision is done through the Crime and Criminal Tracking Network and System and State Police Headquarters. This is because sexual assault crime attract large public attention. So the investigation officers fear that their superiors will punish them for any delay in the report. And this compromises the quality of the investigation report. And the final issue is with regards to the presumption that the accused has committed the offence. The POXO Act provides that the court shall assume that the accused has committed the offence. 
but no such assumption has been taken by the court during the trial so the author is saying that it is time to review the way of implementation of the poxo act this will help in identifying how the act has helped victims of sexual exploitation and what more needs to be done to ensure justice and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about poxo act 2012 then we saw the reasons why it was enacted then we saw about the features of the poxo act and finally we saw some issues associated with poxo act see this topic is very important for your mains exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news article this news article talks about monetary policy according to the article the reserve bank of india's 2023 monetary policy objective is to hold inflation within the band of 4 plus or minus 2 percentage and in the medium term rbi aims to keep the inflation level under 4 percentage by 2024 This is about the news article given here. Now, in this context, let us see about the monetary policy of the Reserve Bank of India. First of all, what is monetary policy? Monetary policy refers to the use of monetary instruments under the control of RBI to regulate interest rates, money supply, and availability of credit to achieve the ultimate objectives of economic policy. The primary objective of monetary policy is to maintain price stability while keeping in mind the objective of the growth. As per the RBI Act of 1934. The Reserve Bank of India is vested with the responsibility of conducting monetary policy. Under monetary policy, there are two methods of credit control. One is quantitative or general credit control policy. The other is qualitative or selective credit control policy. In quantitative credit control, the RBI uses instruments like repo and reverse repo rates, marginal standing facility, cash reserve ratio, statutory liquidity ratio, open market operations, and bank rate. to control the amount of credit provided under qualitative credit control policy rbi may impose a ceiling on credit in this rbi uses tools like rationing of credit moral suasion and direct action using these tools rbi will restrict the lending capacity of banks now coming to the types of monetary policy the monetary policy of the rbi is divided into two types one is expansionary monetary policy and the other is contractionary monetary policy The expansionary monetary policy is also called cheap money policy. This is because during expansionary policy loans become cheap. In case of expansionary policy, the RBI takes steps to increase money supply in the economy. The RBI brings down policy rates to increase money supply. RBI follows expansionary monetary policy to aid economic growth. See, during the COVID induced lockdown, the economy stagnated. This is because there was less demand in the economy due to less money supply. To put the economy on a growth path, the RBI followed expansionary monetary policy. The RBI brought down the repo rate. This resulted in an increase in money supply and demand in the economy. The increase in demand resulted in an increase in economic growth. This is about expansionary monetary policy. The next one is contractionary monetary policy. It is also called dear money policy. because during contractionary policy loans become costlier rbi follows dear money policy to bring down inflation in case of dear money policy rbi increases the policy rate see presently inflation is very high in india this is because there is an excessive money supply in the economy it is due to this the rbi has been increasing the repo rate and the increase in repo rate makes loans costlier which in turn brings down money supply This decrease in money supply will bring down inflation. This is about contractionary monetary policy of the RBI. So RBI using the monetary policy to find a balance between economic growth and inflation control. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is monetary policy. Then we saw about two methods of credit control. That is qualitative and quantitative credit control. And finally, we saw about two types of monetary policy. That is expansionary and contractionary monetary policy. See this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. UPSC has already asked many questions regarding monetary policy, so make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article here. It has appeared in the Infocus page of the Chennai edition. It talks about the Nilgiri Mountain Railway. The 46.6 km line from the Mettupalayam to the Udagamandalam is among the three mountain railways that still run in the country. The other two are the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway and the Kalka Shimla Railway. These three lines are collectively designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site 
under the name Mountain Railways of India. The Darjeeling Himalayan Railway received the honor first in 1999 by UNESCO followed by the Nilgiri Mountain Railway in 2005. The Kalka Shimla Railway received the World Heritage Site designation in 2008. This is the crux of the news article. Now in this context let us learn about these three mountain railway lines. First we will see about the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway. It is also called as the toy train. Darjeeling Himalayan Railway was built in the British era between 1879 and 1881. It is located in the foothills of the Himalayas in West Bengal. In the year 1878, Franklin Prestage, an agent of the Eastern Bengal Railway, recognized the utility of rail link between the hills of Darjeeling and the plains. His scheme was mainly driven by hard economic considerations. For example, the huge difference in the cost of essential commodities between Darjeeling and Silguri. because the need to carry out t for export and the inability of the existing road to handle the growing traffic so this resulted in the construction of 2 feet gauge railway line from silguri to darjeeling this is all about darjeeling himalayan railway now we'll see about nilgiri mountain railways know that it is more than 125 year old and has become one of the primary drivers of tourism in the hill of uti it was originally planned by the then governor general lord dalhousie while being on a sick bed in the nilgiris in 1845 he suggested one strategic line from madras to the western coast with a branch to the foot of nilgiris that idea materialized into the nilgiri mountain railway as we see it today as i told earlier it runs from metupalayam to udagamandalam that is uti know that the nilgiri mountain railway is the only rack railway in india this is all about nilgiri mountain railway Now finally we will see about the Kalka Shimla railway. Know that the Kalka Shimla railway runs between Kalka and Shimla. Before the railway's construction the only access to Shimla was by village cartway. So this railway line was constructed by the Delhi Ambala Kalka railway company in 1898 in the Shivalik hills and it was completed in 1903. Know that the Kalka Shimla railway has over 100 tunnels and more than 840 bridges. and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the three famous mountain railways of india and know that these three railway lines are collectively designated as unesco world heritage site under the name of mountain railways of india now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here the news is that the central government is planning to develop chamundi hills which is a pilgrimage site located in mysore district of karnataka under the prasad scheme So to save Chamundi Hills various citizens and NGOs are demanding for a clearance from heritage panel before the central government attempts to make any developmental works in the Chamundi Hills under the prasad scheme this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context we will learn more about the prasad scheme in this discussion see the term prasad stands for national mission on pilgrimage regeneration and spiritual heritage augmentation drive note that it is a central sector scheme which means that it is entirely financed by the central government it was launched by the ministry of tourism during the financial year 2014 to 15 see india is a land of many religions and we go for many religious yatras basically the growth of domestic tourism hugely depends on pilgrimage tourism so the government recognized that if pilgrimage sites are developed it would give a boost to the tourism sector Therefore the Prasad scheme focuses on developing pilgrimage sites across India for enriching the religious tourism experience. Now what about the aim of the Prasad scheme? The scheme aims to integrate pilgrimage destinations in a prioritized planned and sustainable manner. The scheme would also provide a complex religious tourism experience. See there were many issues with the existing infrastructure of the religious places. like lack of budget hotel roads last mile connectivity then lack of hygiene and cleanliness then lack of solid waste management and a lack of code of religious etiquette for the tourist so the prasad scheme basically tries to resolve these issues and these are the detailed objectives of the scheme pass the video and go through it know that as a part of the scheme there are certain permissible infrastructure development works which includes development of passenger terminals eco friendly transportation then clean source of energy for street lighting then money exchange counters then wayside amenities then parking facilities and shoreline development and regeneration of natural water bodies 
அண்ட் ஃபைனலி இம்ப்ரூவ்மெண்ட் இன் கம்யூனிகேஷன் த்ரூ இன்டர்நெட் கனெக்டிவிட்டி அண்ட் ஒய்ஃபை ஹாட்ஸ்பாட்ஸ் நான் லுக்கர் திஸ் மேப் ஹியர் திஸ் ஆர் த ரிலீஜியஸ் சைட்ஸ் தட் ஆர் பீங் டெவலப்ட் அண்டர் த பிரசாத் ஸ்கீம் பாஸ் த வீடியோ அண்ட் கோ த்ரூ இட் அண்ட் தட்ஸ் ஆல் ரிகார்டிங் திஸ் டிஸ்கஷன் இன் திஸ் டிஸ்கஷன் விஸ் ஆ அபவுட் த பிரசாத் ஸ்கீம் இட்ஸ் எய்ம் அண்ட் வி ஆல்சோ சா சம் அப்ஜெக்டிவ்ஸ் and we saw some infrastructure development works that are being carried out as a part of prasad scheme and finally we saw about some religious sites that are being developed under the prasad scheme now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that an iit madras incubated film has developed an indigenous mobile operating system called var os it is an indigenous os that can be installed in commercial off the shelf handsets The development of OS is funded by the Department of Science and Technology under its National Mission on Interdisciplinary Cyber Fiscal Systems. This is the crux of the news article given here. So in this discussion we will see about this BAR OS. BAR OS service is a mobile operating system which is built on a foundation of trust. It is built with a focus on providing users more freedom, control and flexibility to choose and use only the apps that fit their needs. Now let us see some of its features. See Bar OS comes with no default apps that is NDA. This means that users are not forced to use apps which are not familiar to them or which they do not trust. Additionally, this approach allows users to have more control over the permissions that apps have on the device. Secondly, Bar OS offers native over the air that is no to updates. This helps to keep the device secure. Note updates are automatically downloaded and installed on the device. This means that there is no need for the user to manually initiate the process. This feature ensures that the device is always running the latest version of the operating system which includes the latest security patches and bug fixes. Finally, Bar OS provides access to trusted apps from organization specific private app store services. A private app store services provides access to a specific list of apps which are thoroughly verified whether they have met the security and privacy standards of organizations or not. This means that the users can be confident that the apps they are installing are checked for any potential security vulnerabilities or privacy concerns. See with no default apps then native over the air updates and private app store services bar os ensures that indian mobile phones are trustworthy this innovative system promises to revolutionize the way users think about security and privacy on their mobile devices and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about bar os which is nothing but an indigenous mobile operating system developed by iit madras incubator film then we saw about some of the features of bar os Now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions Now look at this first question this question is regarding Bharatanatyam Now let's take up this first statement Abhinaya Darpana is a textual material for the study of the technique and grammar of body movement in Bharatanatyam dance This statement is correct see the Abhinaya Darpana was written by Nandikeshwara It is one of the main sources of textual material for the study of technique and grammar of body movement in Bharatanatyam dance. So statement one is correct. Now coming to the second statement, Bharatanatyam is also known as Ekaharya. This statement is correct as if sign the discussion itself. Bharatanatyam is also known as Ekaharya because in Bharatanatyam dance one dancer takes up many roles in a single performance. Therefore it is called as Ekaharya. So statement 2 is also correct. Now the question is asking for correct statements. So the correct answer for the question is option C both 1 and 2. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding mountain railways in India. Here five mountain railways are given. We have to find which of these mountain railways are designated as UNESCO World Heritage sites. From our discussion we know that Nilgiri Mountain Railway, Darjeeling Himalayan Railway and Kalka Shimla Railway are designated as UNESCO World Heritage sites. The remaining two that is Madheran Hill Railway and Kangar Valley Railway are in the tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So 1, 4 and 5 alone are designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So the correct answer for the question is option C 1, 4 and 5 only. Moving on let's take up this third question. This question is regarding Prasad scheme. Have you looked at this first statement? It was launched by the Ministry of Culture. This statement is incorrect because the Prasad scheme was launched by the Ministry of Tourism. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement, 
it aims at the conservation of heritage urban planning and in increasing the economic growth of heritage cities see actually this statement is incorrect because it is the objective of hriday scheme that is the national heritage development and augmentation yojana so this hriday scheme aims at the conservation of heritage urban planning and in increasing the economic growth of heritage cities whereas prasad scheme focuses on developing pilgrimage sites across india for enriching the religious tourism experience the prasad scheme also aims to integrate pilgrimage destinations in a prioritized planned and sustainable manner so the second statement is incorrect because this statement is about the objective of hriday scheme and not prasad scheme so statement 2 is incorrect now coming to the third statement it is a centrally sponsored scheme this statement is also incorrect because it is a central sector scheme that is the prasad scheme is entirely financed by the central government so statement 3 is also incorrect here the question is asking for incorrect statement all the three statements are incorrect so the correct answer for the question is option c 1 2 and 3 Moving on, let's take up the final question. I will read out the question. The term bar OS, sometimes seen in news, is related to which of the following? As we saw in the discussion, bar OS is an indigenous mobile operating system developed by IIT Madras Incubator Film. So the correct answer for the question is option B. This is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in the community section. Try to answer it. And don't worry, the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify it. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we came to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.